We will be looking at 1 John. Yes, there is a 1 John. There's also a 2 John and there's a 3 John. There's also the Gospel of John. So it's important that you get the right John. <laughs> the, uh, the Epistle of John, 1 John, written about 89. Somewhere it was, it was laying in John's life. Now, I'm not expecting any Father's Day presents because I feel like last week I had mine. Had all my three boys, my family, all that was good enough for me. But I remember when my boys were small. Matter of fact, I remember when I was small. I remember, you know, I can prove, and I'm thankful for this, I can prove my father is real my kids. My kids barely remember their grandfather. They weren't born when my great-grandfather died. In fact, I don't remember. I don't. I, I barely remember. It's easy to accept the reality of who my father, my father, and even my grandfather because my kids saw them. They touched them. Handled them. And so they remember, they know that they were real. They don't know that my great grandfather was ever real. They, you know, about all they do and all they heard. They just assume that there's a great grandfather or a great great grandfather. The only way they can know about my great grandfather is what's been spoken of him from me or my father. Just because they might not have seen him or touched him does not mean that my great-grandfather existed. Understand? Even though I may not have seen him, I may not have touched him, I may not have heard him, he still existed. The only way to know my great-grandfather is through the memory. In that same way, how do we know Jesus is real? I mean, real. Have you touched him? Have you seen him? Some of you may think you've heard him, but I don't think so. But, but have you heard him? How do you know he's real? And that's what we're going to talk about to this morning. That's what John is writing. He is wanting to encourage people to let them know that what we are doing, worshiping Him, is, is worth something. It's, it's not just pointless or meaningless. It's real. He was real. I hope and pray that years from now, the Lord doesn't come back and my great great grandchildren will know me know that I was real because of the memories of my kids and my great my grandkids. Oh, they'll know that. So we're going to look at the reality of Jesus and how we know he can be how we know how we know he's real. And that's what John was going to be talking about this morning. The verses you're about to see will be not be found in any Bible through my translation. Feel free to... This is, I actually did translate. I put it on there and I did it for a reason. Because no translation is perfect. No one gets the, the idea of what the, the Greek, actual Greek said. I am not going to be giving Greek lessons. I am not going to be expounding on that. But there are some very important things found inside of the original Greek text that's not brought out in any version for sake of time and space. So what you'll see is, is a little different type of version. It'll go along pretty good with whatever Bible you're... You'll, you'll get the same message. You won't go change the meaning of it. But that's the reason why when you see it, it'll be different. I guarantee it from any of Bibles that you have. We're going to talk first about the reality of Jesus. And this is what He begins with. In verse 1. 
That which was from the beginning. The beginning. What beginning? Well, you choose where to start now. The beginning. It could go forever. Jesus existed from the beginning. Jesus was not born on December 25th year, you know, 1, 2, or 3, or whatever you want to... That was not when Jesus was created. Jesus existed from the very beginning. He is not someone who was just born and made a name for Himself. He was where the world was created. As a matter of fact, the Scripture tells us that He spoke everything into existence. In the Gospel of John... In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning, He starts out the same way. The point is clear. From the beginning, Jesus Christ was already there. He did not have a beginning. Whatever beginning we want to start with, whether it's at creation, the day you were born, He was there. In that beginning, He was not created. Our Lord and Savior knows what... The other world is all about. He knows what it was like before our beginning. And He's come from there. He came from heaven to earth. Therefore, all that He told us is true. I can tell you all you want to about what heaven's like and what, what happens to you after you die, but the only one who really knows and has told us is Jesus. And His Word is true. The proof of His existence. How do you prove who He is? Well, Jesus proved who He is. How? By partaking of human flesh, by becoming a man, and letting people hear, see, and look upon Him, and actually touching and handling. He became one of us. So that we could actually put our hands on Him. We could actually talk to Him. No, maybe you didn't, but there were a lot of folks who did. He was real to them. He was not some spirit. He was not some ghost. He was not some... Uh, he was real. You could reach out and touch Him. It says here that... We, he says, from that which was from the beginning, which we have heard... Remember, John was with Jesus all the way from the time of his first ministry, from the time of his first ministry, three and a half years later, to when he went to the cross, and then he was there at the empty tomb, and there he saw a resurrected Jesus. He touched him. He spoke to him. He knew that he was real. Now I'm to do something here. If I told you when I was eight years old that I saw UFOs in my backyard, would you believe it? Some of you say, yeah, I believe it. What if I told you that one time I went to Las Vegas and met Bob Denver? Anybody know who Bob Denver is? My hero. Gilligan. Okay. How do I prove it? Well, I wouldn't say photographs, but that didn't turn out too well, did it, dear? <laughs> they cut off his part of the photograph. It was just me smiling. <laughs> How do I? I'm serious, I'm not kidding. Every one of them like that. If I'd just known, I could have switched sides. <laughs> but how do I prove it to you? And can you imagine me actually, see, actually seeing a UFO? Or like some folks, they're taking you up there, you know, and they're, they're taking you on a, a visitation up through the spacecraft, and you come back, and, you, and it happened, and it's real, and then you try to tell everybody that what happened, and everybody's going, <laughs> no, it's not real. Imagine John trying to convince people that not only did he believe that Jesus was real, but that Jesus, he, that he saw him. He talked to him. He touched him. And there were a lot of people who didn't believe it. And so this is the way this letter starts. From the beginning, we have heard. We 
get hurt. I want you to, I want to take just a minute and I want to show you something. If you'll notice it says, be a heard and continue to hear. Your, your small little Greek lesson, okay? The reason why I put that in there is because that's exactly what, when they were speaking it then, that's the, exactly what they were saying. We have heard and continue to hear. The perfect tense in that word, it emphasizes the present or ongoing result of a completed action. We have heard Him and what? And we continue to hear Him. We have seen and continue to see with our eyes which we beheld. Notice He just didn't say me. He didn't say I saw. He said why? All of us. There were 500 people that saw Him as a resurrected person. How many thousands of upon thousands of people when he was walking this, this earth that saw him. How many? Not only Gentiles, not only Jews, but Gentiles and Romans, they saw him hanging upon a cross. How many people, that person who, who drove the nails through his feet and hands, how many of those denied that he was actually real? So when he says we have seen him, we've heard him, and we continue to see and we continue to hear. See, what's so important about continue? Because they didn't, he did not forget what he saw continued in his heart and his mind. What he heard continued and he's writing it down and he has and it's continued to have the same effect. It's, and he's saying it's real. He said, which our eyes have beheld, looked upon. Let me tell you that, that looked upon is not just a glance. It indicates something more strong serious than that. Something more heavy. In other words, he's saying, I looked at him. I examined him thoroughly. I beheld him. A person will never see and understand who Christ is just by glancing at him. If a person wants to know Christ, he has to look intensely and seriously. Oh, I met him once. It's like me saying that I know a celebrity. I know Paul Harvey. I met him. I walked down. I walked down a hallway with him one time. That doesn't mean I know him. It means I've had an encounter with him. That's all it means. John's saying, "I know. I knew him, and I continue to know him. I know who he is." So they heard him. And they're still hearing. They've seen him, and they continue to see him. And we beheld him. And with our hands have handled. Our hands have handled. They handled. John and the early believers handled him. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The word handled means more than just touching. It means to grope and grasp in order to understand. To handle in order to examine closely. Not a mere glance, but to look intensely, to, to handle. Do you remember? It's, it's a graphic word, and it's the very same word that Jesus used to prove He was not a spirit after His resurrection. Remember Philip? Didn't believe? What did Jesus do? He said, Behold, my hands and feet that it is I myself, it's the same word here, handle me and see. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see, as you see me have. He, remember he told Philip, handle me, touch me, pinch me, I'm real. Pinch me. John's making a statement here. And then he clarifies it at the end. Regarding the word of life. He is he's referring to Jesus who is the word of life. The very message of life. The good news, the gospel of life. A definite statement. I promise you. I was there. I heard him. I touched him. I handled him. 
free. The question is, how can He be that real to us? Well, the answer is found and continue. We have heard and continue to hear. We have seen and continue to see. What is it? What is it that makes you? You ask me how I know He lives. He lives within my heart. He's real. Because there was a point in time, I hope this is the case for you, a point in time that you ask Him into your heart, into your life to save you, to change you, to make you one of His. And you had an encounter with Him where He touched you, where he, you heard Him. A time when He was as real as real could be. Is He that real today for you? Or did you just hear and not continue to hear? Did you just see and not continue to see? You see, that Jesus had been gone 50 years. And John is writing his memory of Jesus. He is, he is telling them what he remembers about him. And saying, yep, yeah, he's real. I was there. I touched him. I heard him. I saw him. And I'm reporting to you. And in that way, they were continuing to hear. And he was continuing to see Jesus in their lives. And so I ask you, is he real to you? Is he as real to you today as he was the moment you, he came to you and asked and told you you need to be saved and you said yes? Is he as real to you today? Or have you just heard you seen? I think too many times we just go through life as saved children of God, forgetting about our memory of Jesus, the realness of it. In verse 2, is the revealing of Jesus. So how do we today, how do we reveal Jesus to us, uh, to others? Verse 2 says, And the life was revealed. The light of God, the, uh, the word of life, he, Jesus was it, and the life was revealed. Jesus was revealed, and we have seen, and we continue to see, and we are testifying and reporting to you all the, uh, all the eternal life which was with the Father and was revealed to us. He says, What we've seen, and we continue to see, we're going to testify and we're going to report to you, to you all, about the eternal life which was with the Father and which was revealed to us. You see, this started a long time before John. James and Peter and James were fishing in a boat. Along comes Jesus. Looked at them. What are you doing? Well, we're fishing. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Just out of their boat they fall. It was real. And Jesus revealed to them who he was. And then a little later on, we see, we see in first in John, the first chapter, it says, the following day Jesus wanted to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to Philip, follow me. Now Philip was, the, was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathaniel. So Philip was introduced to Jesus and what did Philip do? He went to Nathaniel. And what he and, and he said, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to, to him, Come and see. The story goes on. Nathaniel wasn't sure. Jesus told him what he was doing just a little bit before they met. And finally he proclaimed him as the Messiah. Come and see. When it is revealed to us, what is the first thing that we should do? Reveal it to others. Come and see. Because I believe 
that if we really believe Jesus was as real as the moment we come to know Him as Savior, I believe that we'd be telling more people about the realness of Jesus. It is not some fairy tale. It is not some made-up story in order to get collect money for the church. It is not something along that. It is he's real. What he did at the cross was real. His resurrection was real. People saw it. People heard it. And they, from that moment on, have been telling one person after the next for 2,000 years that he's real. And guess what? In that way, we are continuing to hear and we are continuing to see and Jesus has touched our lives and we know that He's real. So we need to reveal Him to others. And what is it that the most important thing about this revealing? This, reveal, this most important thing is revealing His eternal life. I can tell you about all His miracles. I can tell you about how it happened wise and smart and philosophical he was. I can tell you that he was a good man. I can tell you he was a great prophet. <laughs> but that doesn't that, that's not the story that needs to be told. That's not the thing that needs to be heard. That's not the thing that needs to be revealed to others. It is his eternal life. Jesus Christ went to the cross of Calvary. He went, died for us. He came, went to the cross, died for us, and three days later, He rose again, giving us hope of eternal life. He went and went to the cross in our place. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And what is the penalty of death, of our sin? The penalty is death. He took our place. That's what needs to be told over and over again. Do you sometimes feel foolish telling somebody about their salvation, asking them if they know Jesus Christ as their Savior? And do you feel like, oh, you're going to laugh at me. Don't be ashamed of it. He's real. This is not some fairy tale that we made up. This is literally eternal life or death. We need to be real. And we didn't need to know He's real. And we need to know. We need to tell others that He's real. He revealed His eternal life. That is the gospel. That is what we need to do. We can tell people about how to have a good life. Live a good life. We can tell people how they should, the Bible tells them to live. And that's all fine and good. But that ain't going to save them. It's only this message that will. So what happens? What does John say happens? What are the results of the revealing? Let's look at verse 3 and 4. Here we go again. That which we have seen and continue to see and heard and continue to hear, we are declaring to you all in order that you may be having fellowship with us. You can have fellowship with us. We can experience the fullness of life with all other believers who give who truly give their lives to follow Christ. We can have fellowship together. The kind of fellowship that exists within the greatest of all families, the family of God Himself. We can have fellowship together. We're all going to be in heaven one day. Those who know Jesus, the all believers, we're all going to be together again. We might all start liking each other a little bit more. Because we're going to have eternity together, together uh, with each other. So if we tell somebody, if there's somebody that you care about, that you love, that you think they need to know about Jesus, that you need to reveal to them about the realness of Jesus and about His everlasting salvation, is there somebody in your life that you know and love? Would you like to have fellowship with them for the rest of your life? And in eternity. That's what the revealing of the gospel can do. That's what the revealing of Jesus Christ to, to someone who doesn't know him yet, that's what it can do. Presence and fellowship of believers. Converse. Hearing that others walk in the truth. Giving of ourselves. 
time from us to one another. Those are all things that happen in this world because we have shared and revealed that Jesus Christ to us. Look what it says here. In order that ye may be having fellowship with us and our fellowship with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. You can have fellowship with God. God has revealed Himself in the Lord Jesus Christ and showed us that He deeply loves and He deeply cares for us and that He wants us to have fellowship with, with Him. I want you to imagine Jesus Christ. The same Jesus Christ, that real person that John touched, heard, and seen, had conversations with, ate with, that same Jesus wants to have a fellowship with you in this life. He came to birth to show us that we can know God personally and we can have fellowship with God. Remember Adam and Eve in the garden before sin came into the world? They were daily walking with God Himself in the cool of the evening. God wants that back. He wants that time back with us. We can actually fellowship with God we can, by becoming acceptable to Him. We can relate to Him. We can talk and share with Him. We can have Him walk us through, walk through our life, looking after Him, caring about us step by step. Asking for strength to conquer the trials of life. We will know that He can give, constantly give us a, a life of joy love, joy, and peace. Know that He will deliver us from sin and death and you know that He'll give us eternal life. That we can depend upon Him for righteousness so that we can be acceptable to Him. All of these things are results of sharing the gospel with someone else. Not necessarily for you. You have those things. But for that person that you care about, that person that you love, they need to hear this message. fellowship with others, you can fellowship with God. And here's the good, verse 4. Verse 4, And these things we are writing you all, in order that your joy may have been made full and continue being full. <laughs> it's not a one-time thing. When you were saved, when you asked Jesus Christ into your life, you became a child of, of God. When that happened, you were joyful. Your life, your, your life was full of joy. What happened? Is it still as full as it was then? Is your joy in your life as full then and now as it was then? You see, he's writing all of this. Not just this first four verses, but this entire book. In order that our joy may have been made full and continue to be full. And it all boils down to this. Our joy can be full if we recognize the reality of Jesus. That He's real in our hearts and our lives. That He is there every single moment of our day. Every single moment of our life. When we recognize that, it becomes real. And when it becomes real, we begin to realize that those folks around us may not know that reality. And we begin to tell them about Jesus. Joy is divine. It's possessed and given only by God. And its roots are not in any earthly or, or material things or cheap triumphs in life. I, you know, I'll enjoy sports. I enjoyed watching football games and now baseball games. My joy was full last weekend and it's not quite as full as it was last night. Why? Because I, my joy is not contingent, was contingent upon the regular baseball team winning. That's not joy. Real joy has nothing to do with this life. It has everything to do about the life after the promises that God has given us. It does not depend upon circumstances or happiness. Happiness depends upon happiness, but the joy that God implants in the believer's hearts overrides all, even the matters of life and death. Joy springs from faith. Romans 15, 13 says this, Now the God of hope 
fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Joy of future rewards makes and keeps one faithful. This is the point of the entire book so that we'll have a joy-filled life instead of one constantly doubting whether or not God is in control or that Jesus is actually real. And that realness will spur us to tell others. And that joy will draw, will draw others to us. See, our source of joy is fellowship with God. Our source, 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 of, source of joy is the failure victory over sin. Our source of joy is repentance, hope of glory, God's Word, obeying God's commandments. Those are things that all of these things help us understand God is real and our joy can be full. And then prayer. Prayer is one thing that should cause us joy. Because we know that when we pray from the depths of our heart to our Lord and our Savior, He hears us and He answers that prayer. It should make sense. Knowing that He's in control and that He's willing to answer our prayers. It's the reveal. It's the reality of Jesus and the revealing of Him to a lost and dying world. And it's the effect that that revealing has on people, the effect of their whole life being changed. I hope that you've experienced that. And I hope that your joy is continually being. And if it's not, then maybe you've forgotten who your Lord and Savior is. Maybe you've forgotten what He's done for you. Going back to where we started. I remember having good memories of my grandparents. Grandpa. Great father, great grandfather, not much. Very, very good. And I heard the story, my mom would tell you all the stories, and I've heard them a dozen times. great-grandfather of mine at the turn of the 20th century. He was a writer. He wrote all kinds of stuff. You know, after reading some of his, his writings, I felt like I knew. Out of all my relatives I've never seen, he wrote something down. And I knew he was real because he wrote something. Touch what he wrote. I could the things that he wrote about. I could relate to some of the places and things, and, and, I, and I knew he'd be real. John was sharing with us today about his memories of Jesus, and he requires and wants us to share with others our memories. He said, "Brother Randy, I can't tell you about that." He said, "Yes, you can." They get to share with, share with that person. God has sent you to share with. Share your memories of what He did for you. Have a heart and a life that's joy, that's full of joy, and continues to be full no matter what happens in your life. And if you're here this morning and you've never asked Jesus Christ into your heart and into your life. There is nothing more important than doing that today. Because what I have effectively done this morning is reveal to you who Jesus is. I have done what John, I have, I have told you what John has wrote to these people. These people wrote it down. It ended up in God's Word, His book. And now I'm relating it to you. And if you're here today and you don't know Christ your Savior, He's been revealed to you. He is real. There was a person 2,000 years ago who touched him, who heard him, who handled him, who believed him, who followed him. And there were millions upon millions after him who took his word 
and believed after him. And when they did, Jesus touched their hearts and life. And they were able to hear, they were able to see through God's word. I know he's real because I met him. He came and lived in my heart. I asked him. And I believe. Have you? If you haven't, I believe that he's asking you today to do that very same thing. If you're here today and you've never asked him into your heart, if you have believed, you're a saved child of God, member of this church, even, but somehow God doesn't seem real to you anymore. Just the only thing that seems real is things that you can visit. Forgotten. You have forgotten. Jesus is life. As we stand and we sing this morning, this is your opportunity to respond to God's word. I hope and pray that, that the message this morning has touched you in some way, changed you in some way, made you think in some way, and by all means that the Lord deal with your heart in some way. Would you respond to it today?